Welcome back to Special Relativity. In this video, I'm going to re-derive time dilation and length contraction, but using a different technique this time. This time, I'm going to use the fact that the space-time interval is invariant between different inertial reference frames to derive the equations for time dilation and length contraction. But before I begin, let's quickly recall what it means when I say that the space-time interval is invariant. It means that if I have two events A and B in space-time, with space-time coordinates given by x, y, z, and t with the subscript A for event A and the subscript B for event B, then the separation between A and B in four-dimensional space-time is given by our S squared, which is the negative of C times delta TAB squared, plus the sum of squares of the differences in spatial coordinates, so delta X squared, delta Y squared, and delta Z squared. C here is the speed of light, by the way, in vacuum. Bear in mind that in this equation, the delta of a space-time coordinate t, x, y, or z is just the difference in the value of that space-time coordinate between events a and b. Now this s squared between a and b is called the space-time interval between a and b. It's the separation or distance between a and b in four-dimensional space-time. And when I say that the space-time interval is invariant, I mean that no matter what inertial reference frame I use to view a and b, the s squared between a and b will be the same across all inertial reference frames. So I could have an inertial frame where I go in a constant velocity in the northeast direction, the northwest direction, the north direction. No matter which of these inertial frames I use to view A and B, S squared will be the same. This is a critical principle in special relativity in our Minkowski space-time. The individual components, like the delta T, delta X, etc., those might change between different inertial reference frames, but the overall S squared will remain the same. We discussed this in detail in the last video, so go see that if you need a refresher. Anyway, let's move on to deriving the time dilation and length contraction equations using the invariance of our space-time interval. We'll consider a single scenario. Suppose I have a train moving at a velocity v in the positive x direction relative to the ground reference frame. I'll call the ground reference frame r and the train's reference frame r prime. We'll also suppose that the length of this train measured by somebody inside the train is L0, so the proper length of the train according to an observer that's at rest relative to the train. The next thing I'll do is suppose that there's a ray of light that fires from the left end of the train, hits the right end, and reflects back. I'll call the initial firing event A, then I'll call the hit on the right end of the train event B, then I'll call the reflection and return back to the left end event C. We'll suppose that our time starts when the x-coordinates of both r and r prime perfectly line up at zero, so when t and t prime are zero, x and x prime are also zero. Let's now examine these events from the point of view of the observers in both reference frames. We'll start with the reference frame r prime, which is a pretty simple scenario. To an observer in r prime, so somebody inside the train, my ray of light starts firing as event a, travels a distance L0 to the right end, so event B, and then travels back a distance L0 to the left end, so event C. I can draw a space-time diagram with T prime as my time coordinate and X prime as my spatial coordinate to describe these events from the point of view of someone in the reference frame R prime. My world line of light, or light line, will be this straight line once again at a 45 degree angle. Note that I've ignored the y and z directions here because there's no motion of either the train or the ray of light along the y and z directions, so those directions don't really matter here. Now I'll suppose that event A starts exactly as the clocks of the two reference frames R and R prime synchronize and when those reference frames line up, so in my space-time diagram I can let my A start at the origin. Event B is when the light ray hits the right side of the train, which is at x prime equals L0, the length of my train according to an observer in the reference frame R prime. We'll suppose that the ray of light takes a time delta T0 over 2 to reach L0, to reach event B. Notice here that event B lies on the light line, and that's because it's a simple ray of light traveling between events A and B, and so events A and B are therefore light-like separated. Let's now draw event C. This event occurs when light travels back to the left end of the train, so x prime equals zero. To travel back to the left end of the train, the ray of light takes the same time delta t naught over two. This makes sense. After all, the light ray travels the same distance l naught, but this time to the left, and the speed of light is a constant c in all inertial reference frames, so it'll take the same amount of time delta t naught over two as it did to go from a to b. Note that just like with A and B, events B and C are also light-like separated. 
So now I've drawn my events A, B, and C on the space-time diagram for an observer in the reference frame R prime. Let's now determine the space-time intervals between each of these event pairs. And later on in the video, I'm going to do the same thing from the point of view of somebody in the reference frame R, and then equate the corresponding pairs of space-time intervals to derive my time dilation and length contraction equations. We'll first start with the space-time interval for A and C. In the primed reference frame, the space-time interval is the negative of C delta T naught whole squared because there's no spatial separation between A and C in the R prime reference frame. Next, we'll calculate the space-time interval for events A and B. This is again pretty simple. The negative square of C times the time separation between A and B, which is just delta T naught over 2, plus the square of the spatial separation, so L naught squared. The space-time interval for events B and C can also be calculated similarly, in fact it's the exact same. The time separation is delta T naught over 2 once again, and the spatial separation squared is again L naught squared. The other important thing to note here is the actual value of these space-time intervals between A and B and B and C. I mentioned up here that the pairs of the events A and B and B and C are light-like separated events. If you recall my previous video, this means that the space-time interval between these events is zero, so we can actually set either of these S prime A, B, or B, C to zero, and when I do this, I find that my length L is either plus or minus C delta T naught over 2 because of the squared part, but in this case I can ignore the negative solution because there's no such thing as a negative length. This means that when I isolate my delta T naught, I just get 2 L naught over C, which makes sense because this is just a variation of speed equals distance over time. I'll call this equation 1. So now we're done dealing with the reference frame R prime, let's now look at things from the perspective of someone in reference frame R. We'll again draw our events A, B, and C, but this time it'll be a bit more complicated. Let's draw our space-time diagram again, but this time with unprimed coordinates T and X. Again, I've drawn the light line over here like so. Let's begin with event A. According to the observer in R, this is what event A looks like. The train is lined up at x equals 0, at time equals 0, and the light ray starts to fire, so that means on our space-time diagram, A is again at the origin, which makes sense. Now, after a certain time delta t1 in the R reference frame, notice that I haven't made delta t1 and delta t0 over 2 equal to each other, because we're assuming that the times will be different a priori, we don't necessarily know that they're the same. After a certain time delta t1 in the R reference frame, my light ray hits the right side of the train, so event B, and when event B occurs, the train has moved to the right by a distance v times delta t1 in the R reference frame, so the spatial coordinate of event B in the R reference frame is v times delta t1 plus the length of the train L. And I've labeled the length as L instead of L0 because in general I expect L to be different from L0. That's the whole idea behind length contraction, so I have to keep L different. So I'm going to label this event B on my space-time diagram like so. Again, B is on the light line because the ray of light goes from A to B, so once again, A and B are light-like separated. And they should be light-like separated because they were light-like separated in the R prime reference frame. So again, their space-time interval in this unprimed frame is also zero because the space-time interval between R and R prime should be the same, it should be invariant. And finally, after a certain time delta t2, the ray of light hits the left end of the train again, so event c, and when this occurs, the left end of the train has traveled a distance v times delta t1 plus delta t2 to the right. I'm going to label this on my space-time diagram like so. And notice that this box that I've defined corresponding to event c is actually displaced to the right. I've only done this for the purposes of keeping the diagram clean. In actual fact, this third box should be overlapping with the second box. Anyway, I'm also going to now define my delta t, the overall time interval in the R reference frame, as the sum of delta t1 and delta t2. Again, just like how a and b were light-like separated, b and c are also light-like separated. Now the reason I've made my delta t1 and delta t2 different from each other is that in going from a to b, it takes the ray of light longer in the reference frame R because the right end of the train is moving away from it. But in going from b to c, it takes the ray of light less time because the left end of the train is moving towards that ray of light, and that's why I've labeled delta t1 and delta t2 differently. They're not the same, as we'll show shortly. Let's now calculate our space-time intervals in this reference frame R. 
We'll start with the space-time interval for A and C, which is just the negative square of C times the time separation between A and C plus the square of the X separation. Now we know that this space-time interval should equal the S prime squared of AC, which we found before, according to the invariance of the space-time interval. So that means I get this equation relating my time interval measured in R, the delta T, to the proper time interval measured in R prime between the same two events A and C. When I now multiply both sides by negative one and isolate the delta t term, this is what I get for my delta t squared. And finally, if I now take the square root of both sides, I find that my delta t equals the proper time interval delta t naught divided by the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And this is just my time dilation equation. The proper time interval between two events increases or dilates by the square root factor when those same two events are observed by an observer moving relative to those two events. I'm going to call this equation 2. Next, we'll calculate the space-time interval for events A and B. This is again pretty simple, the negative square of C times the time separation between A and B, which is delta T1, plus the square of the spatial separation, so L plus V delta T1 squared. Just like before, this unprimed space-time interval equals the corresponding prime space-time interval, which means that it's also zero since A and B are light-like separated. As a result, you'll find that L plus V delta T1 whole squared equals C times delta T1 whole squared. If we solve this, we get the following solution. Because length can't be negative, we'll remove the minus solution and just leave a plus. And if we now isolate delta T1, this is what we get. And finally, let's calculate the space-time interval between events B and C. The time separation is now delta T2, and the spatial separation squared is just the difference between the spatial coordinate of B and the spatial coordinate of C. And with some quick algebra, you'll find that the spatial separation is just L minus V delta T2. And just like before, this unprimed space-time interval equals the corresponding primed space-time interval, which means that it's also zero since B and C are light-like separated. And as a result, you'll find that L minus V delta T2 whole squared equals C delta T2 whole squared. If we solve this, we get the following solution. Because length can't be negative, we'll remove the minus solution and just leave a plus. And if we now isolate delta T2, this is what we get. Now delta t, which is the sum of delta t1 and delta t2, when we add those delta t1 and delta t2 expressions, this is what we get, 2cl over c squared minus v squared, which I'll call equation 3. I'll now use equation 2, my time dilation equation, to relate my delta t to the proper time interval delta t naught to get the following. I can also use equation 1 to substitute my delta t naught in terms of the proper length l naught. If I now cancel my 2s and isolate my length L of the train measured in the reference frame R, this is what I get. And now if I divide the numerator just by C squared, this is what I end up with. And if I cancel this numerator term with the square root term in the denominator to end up with a square root on top, I end up with this equation, my length contraction equation. According to this equation, the length of the object measured by an observer in motion is contracted relative to the proper length of the object. So there you go, we've derived the time dilation equation and length contraction equations just by using the fact that the space-time interval is invariant. And in fact, the invariance of the space-time interval is a very powerful result. You can use that to derive most of special relativity and most of the equations that come from special relativity. Anyway, I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.